So, I think that about does it for our Halo discussion. Not that you can't yeah. continue talking about it in time to come, but I will say this is uh, the part where we switch over to doing Super Chats, and of course, anyone must abandon. They may. But I think you guys mentioned you're happy to stay on already, so I guess... Yeah, yes. Go yeah, for I it. And, um, and may, may I touch on a few things before we go on uh, Super Chats? Yes. I will Just, allow it. Sure. Okay. So the the first thing I think is really interesting is the um the interview with Variety magazine and one of yeah. the showrunners of the Halo show. Um cuz this went viral on Twitter where Variety had interviewed Stephen Kane. And uh this was this was where the quote came up where he said uh we didn't look at the games, right? And that pissed off a shitload of people. And uh I have the the quote here, actually. Hang on. Right. That was one of the writers, Stephen we... Kane, right? <laughs> yeah, one I, he's one of the key showrunners. I think there's two, maybe three of them. He said, we didn't look at the games. Um, we started with the games. Oh, no, no, wait. We, we, uh, the, the, in the first instance they were interviewed, the Variety said that Stephen Kane had said we didn't look at the games, and then that was published in the article. And then Stephen Kane on Twitter, of his own accord, responded to the Variety article, and he said, Headlines are fun, but this is what I really said, implying that Variety had misquoted him. And I suspect that that's not the case. I feel like they didn't want to admit that they neglected the games more than they should have, and they did a bit of damage control. You know what I mean? And then they, he said, uh, uh, what, I, what I really said was, so he wasn't implying that he um, misspoke, or he was directly implying that uh, Variety had misrepresented him. And I don't think they would do that. Like, if they, like, Variety used a direct quote, I don't think they would get that wrong. But anyway, Stephen Kane said, uh, we... St what I really said was we started with the games and then we went to 343 and they shared all the lore with us so we could give you the full Halo experience. And I'm like, well, what is the full Halo experience? What do you mean by that? Is the full Halo experience, like, does that mean catering to the fans of the games or just what, uh, like, is that only apply to the story that you want, only you want to tell and that has no nothing to do with what's been established in the game so far. Like, there's something really fishy about that whole variety thing. Especially looking back and seeing how, like, people hate this show. Yeah. Right. Like, who are you catering to? Did you actually talk to anyone who played the games? Like, what do you, what, you just wanted to do your own thing. You clearly just wanted to do your own thing. And you yeah. wanted to take Halo and parade around its, its, just, its imagery to sell to sell your show it's just something that you could use for its utility and nothing more you seem to have utter contempt for the concept of a story in a video game like you're above video games right yeah they treat the medium i think with contempt it's like well this is television this is where this the is real like yeah, good stories yeah. get told like f you dude yeah <laughs> those boy toys video games are just dumb stupid nonsense we're gonna tell we're gonna introduce them to art Right. We're going to culture these we're going to culture these savages. It feels oh, very like did. elitist, yeah. Ha. And, and uh so I th I thought that was interesting. And then the other thing is um I think the show is afraid of keeping Chief's helmet on more than it should be because they underestimate the degree to which emotions can be conveyed by a helmet helmeted character. Yeah. And um, this is something that ties to my own productions. If I may talk about Arby and the Chief briefly, I filmed this show with action figures of Chief and Arbiter, and they obviously don't have animated faces um but it's shot and written in such a way that i often find myself getting comments such as 
oh man, in this scene in Arby and the Chief, you can totally see this expression on Chief's face, which is really interesting, right? Because it's like, it's an action figure. How, how could that possibly be the case? How are audiences projecting a facial expression onto an inanimate object, right? And the phenomenon is due to the Kuleshov effect, which I probably, I might have mentioned in this podcast previously, I can't remember, but I think it's worth mentioning again here because it relates to the, the, the thing with Chief always taking his helmet off, almost to a comedic degree, where it's like, it's like trolling the audience almost, where it's like you had all this promotional material for the show with, with Chief with his helmet on, right? Like you were saying, Fringy. And then uh, as the show goes on into episode two and onward, he's taking it off to an absurd degree. And then there'll be a beat where he puts it on, and then 20 seconds later, he takes it off again. Like, I can't remember this scene. It's like he's, he puts it on, oh, he goes for a yeah, brief yeah, warthog drive, drive, and then he, and then he takes home. it off again. Like, are you kidding me? I thought this was going to be like, oh, here's the sequence where we get to see Helmeted Chief for a bit. But no, it's like this, the show is so scared of keeping his helmet on because it's worried that the audience is going to lose the connection with the main character because he has a helmet on. Like, oh, if I can't see his face, then I can't relate to this dude, which is totally the wrong approach to this. There is a, there are really effective ways of, of having a helmeted character convey emotion. I think there's uh, the Mandalorian is an example that is, uh, like, I haven't watched all of the Mandalorian, but I think that's a show that at least occasionally does it really well. Um, but uh, in the case of my show, Arby and the Chief, it's like, you know, if, if I have, like, Master Chief sucks at Halo, for instance, where I have the toy chief holding the controller, and then he's trash-talking for, like, five, ten minutes straight, and then you cut to a shot of him getting banned off of Halo 3 or whatever, and then you just cut to him totally silent, no dialogue, just uh, holding on his face on, like, an extreme close-up or whatever, you can cut, you can, you hang your perceptions on the icon that you're seeing on the screen, in this case, Chief, and you can, you're, you can already tell what he's thinking. Like, oh, I can't believe I've just been kicked out of this game. This is bullshit, right? And it's just, it's funny just without dialogue. I mean, I think it is. I think that's one of the reasons it worked. And uh, I understood this so early, like when I was a kid about film. And so it's frustrating seeing these Halo showrunners who don't even understand this basic concept about film. To go back to the Kuleshov effect thing. So this, it was this guy who uh, generated this example of how this phenomenon works in film. Where um, people f uh, figure out what it is a character is thinking. And it has very little to do with the expression on their face. And much more to do with the juxtaposition of shots. Right? You see, you see a shot of a person looking at something. And then you cut to reverse shot of whatever it is they're looking at. And then you cut back to them. And depending on what that middle shot is, it, deter it determines what the intent the, uh, the audience projects on that character is. So the famous example is a guy staring at a picture of a bowl of soup, right? And it's like, oh, that guy's really hungry. He's like really longing for that bowl of soup. <laughs> or like, it's like, a, or another example is a bicycle. And it's like, oh, that guy really wants to ride that bicycle. But in both examples, the guy has a blank facial expression. He's not doing anything different with his face. So it's just in the juxtaposition of shots. But it's, I mean, that, that example illustrates the juxtaposition in particular, but I think there's other factors at play, which is the duration of the shots and also the framing of the shots. Yeah, whether they're the like a... All that, yeah. Right. Music if it's a, that might be in the background or... Right. Uh, I, essentially, like the proximity of Posture. the camera to the subject. So if the camera is distant, it implies an emotional distance uh, between the subject and whatever that subject is looking at. But if, if you were to cut to like a, an extreme close-up of that guy looking at whatever the object is, it would imply that, oh, that guy's really emotionally invested in whatever this thing is. And it, now, you, if you... If you showed me someone who is looking at a, for instance, bowl of Tom Yum, difficulty easy, prep time 30 minutes, then I would definitely know that they're looking at it longingly because they love it. <laughs> the 
<laughs> and they right. need to get them some of that. <laughs> yes, you stare longingly at the Halo cookbook and you think, oh man, those recipes from across the galaxy, I could really reuse some of those right now. Um, but there's a there's a Hitchcock uh, Alfred Hitchcock example that's uh, even funnier. Did you almost say Hitchcockian? I did, and it you sounded gonna, so uh, douchey. Uh, so douchey, and I was like, okay, I better not say that. Yes, but uh, but you know what I mean, right? Where you have you have a uh, three shot pattern, right? Shot number one, you got an old guy. I think it was Hitchcock himself in the example where he's squinting at something. That's shot number one. Shot number two is a woman holding a baby in her arms, like nursing it. And then shot number three is Hitchcock smiling at what he's seeing. So the implication there is the audience is reading his face. And based off of the second shot, the audience is thinking, oh, he likes this, that this woman is nursing her baby. He finds it nice that this, you know, infant is being mothered and cared for. You take that same example, you replace shot number two with a woman in a bikini, right? So you have Alfred Hitchcock squinting at something, shot, shot of a woman in a bikini, cut back to him and he's smiling. All of a sudden it's a dirty old man who's getting a kick out of seeing a woman in scantily clad clothing. And so the intent of the character that the audience is perceiving has completely changed based on the shot alone, and it has nothing to do with um, a change in the actor's face. It's the same facial expression, right? So what I'm getting at here is the juxtaposition is key. And in Halo, they're ignoring the potential of playing with the ambiguity of Chief having his helmet on and leaving the audience guessing as to what he's thinking like w one of my favorite beats in the halo show it's it's built off of like s nonsense with the whole like him getting an order to kill kwan and whether K chief would like be motivated to do that in terms of like the character we know him as but i'm just saying in terms of like visuals on a surface level chief gets the order s at article 72 whatever the order via his helmet to kill kwan and he's staring at Quan, and then you cut to Chief, and he's just eerily kind of you just look you just see his helmet. He's wearing his helmet, and he's looking at Quan, and the camera just kind of holds on him for a beat, and you're not really sure what he's gonna do. I actually really like that, even though it was built on a bunch of nonsense. I like that visual beat, and I wish they actually extended it a bit more. Like cut back to Quan, and then she's like creeped out like what is it what are you looking at i think and, i think the main issue for that scene comes with i don't know who this is i have no idea if this is something that he'd do or not because i don't know who this person is they they rely on you knowing master chief from the games to even give that anything anything resembling dramatic help tension the, the unsc seem to think that he would carry it out immediately yeah so like that so it puts us in a position a of figuring out who this is part of why the inhibitors are treated the way they are by us. It's like they, the UNSC seem to think that they are automatons, but then all we have to go off visually is that he touched the artifact and that has fucked with his brain to the point where he's no longer simply going to execute a person that's chilling out. Because they should know that already. They should know, like, oh, Chief's the kind of guy who probably wouldn't kill us. We can't just ask him to do that. But no, they seem to be fully confident that he would do it. And right. so him not doing it to us is like, okay. What does that mean? What are you telling us? Yeah. And it and it's almost like a lose-lose in this scenario because it implies that the UNSC is just stupid and evil and if Master Chief doesn't go through with it, that doesn't mean he's like a good person. It's just like that's what I expect from just a person to do by default. You know, it's not a huge win morally for them to just oh, he didn't do a clearly evil thing. I was like yeah, most wouldn't. That's not a that's not a huge win. You don't gain really anything out of these two character or out of this character making this decision, especially if it's right off the bat. Yes. Right. So uh, I think that there's a lot of potential here for like telling a story about like, a helmeted person where like I there's a 
Chief being fully suited and helmeted Personal. serves as a metaphor, I think, for somebody who is so um, augmented and battle hardened that you you can't recognize the humanity in him anymore. And so whenever you look at his helmeted face, you're wondering what's going on in there. Is there a person in there? Like that, I feel like that's kind of the point of that character. But like, at the same the... time, you have those moments where even helmeted up and completely covered as he is, th his humanity does appear in the yes. way that he emotes, the, the few words that he does say, some of this, the gestures that he makes. You can't just, you can cover a man in a suit, but it's still a person beneath, and that will come out here and there. Right. You're absolutely right. Like, one of the, what I like about Chief is he's almost Doom Guy. But, but not quite, where he's like, he serves that function of being a hollow suit of armor for the player to occupy, much like Doom Guy. But he's not like Doom Guy in that there is something to him. There's like a personality trait that's unique to Chief, where he's got a basic sense of right and wrong, right? And occasionally he'll chime in when he needs to and say, this is wrong, this is right, let's do this thing. And, uh, I really like that about it. You know, a man of few words, but he, he really thinks through whatever he does. And um, there's, there's so much opportunity for the show to play with that ambiguity of what's going on under his helmet. But I feel it's either the showrunners or maybe Pablo uh, Schreiber had some input himself in regard to like, well, I don't want to just have my helmet on all the time. I want people to see my face. Like that could be like a... And that's the point where I demand sort like, of thing, you know. Yeah, that's the point where someone who should probably say, "Too bad, you're gonna," uh, or like we're gonna find someone else who isn't gonna bitch. Right. Um, the, I I I don't even mind Pablo. Like I I, I don't, don't mind him at I, all. I think he has a tendency to overact. In a bunch of scenes but there are scenes where he does quite a good job like when he's on the when he's at his old house and he's on the balcony with halsey and he's saying like i saw a vision of you you were there i saw you what were you doing there he plays that scene with a genuine sense of like hurt and confusion like he really doesn't understand but there's a bunch of other scenes where he does this like these things with his eyebrows kind of like the rock and you know where he just kind of gets carried away with how his face is looking and you know that shot in the finale where he says, uh, Cortana, I'm going to need you now. Like it does this dramatic push in and he kind of does this like looking from side to side from either left and right of the lens. It's just a, a little bit too much where his performance is so hyper aware that, of the camera's presence. It's like he's posing for like a, like a boy band cover shoot or something like that. It's like... I just want to be like, forget the cameras there, dude. Just, you know, get lost in the, the role and just, you know, feel it out. Like, like you did on that, in that one scene on the balcony in the, in the house. Like, I, I think you it know, just sort of, I think that most of, that's kind of the issue when you talk about stuff of this quality, this two, three score, horrible show where you wonder at what point does the actors or actresses talent just completely fall prey to they are doing what they are directed to do and you can't even really tell because it's a lot easier to see when it, you could be more certain that an actor succeeds than when an actor fails because there's always that question mm. with stuff of this kind of quality are they just doing is that how many takes did they do and did the directors decide this one was the best for what idea they're trying to get across at what point no, where does one end and the other begin? Um, right. And here, yeah, I never, my, my issues with the show, and maybe it was because I was too just blindsided by all of the plot and character issues, but actor and actress wise, no one really was, I, I, I was never like, oh, you're just a bad actor. It, it was, I don't know, it, it almost like it, it, it kind of reminds me of Milan, the remake. Where yeah. every actor in that is bad, Including and you Jet don't Li. even notice. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, he was amazing in that. <laughs> but mm. like you, you all, you don't even notice how terrible all of the dialogue and like the acting is in that movie because it's all terrible and nothing stands apart from anything else. So it's almost like your brain accepts it as, yeah, this is just, this is just life. And then it yeah. just clicks like, oh shit, everyone has been terrible. This is why I'm hesitant to call a bad performance immediately like bad acting because I think it could just as easily come down to bad writing or bad directing, right? Yeah, like I can't tell which one it is. I don't know if, yeah, when it comes to characters like Quan and stuff, you just, you don't know. Because um, I know the guy who plays uh, Soren, uh, yeah. he was in uh, Fargo. Right. And he was really good. And he just exudes charisma. He's just he just he puts out this aura that you want to like him. And I think that saves his character so much because he just puts out this vibe of a, of a likable person. I forgot he was in that. What season was that? It was ah, Mahler. Help me out. Which season was that? Two. Two. Two, right. Huh. He was uh, he was really awesome in that season. And um, OK. <sighs> uh, OK. Mm. There's yeah. one more example I want to go over. I know I'm I'm yeah. talking too long here. I'm no, sorry. It's fine. But this there's there's this one awesome fucking scene in Halo 2 that I wanted to cite as an example for how you can have a really compare compelling character in a helmeted character like Chief. There's a cut scene in Halo 2. I mean, this is even like it would still be cool even without the blur remastering, but those blur remastered cutscenes are fucking so well done. Phenomenal. Right. And there's my favorite cutscene in Halo 2 is uh, when Chief lands. I think it's like after it's Chief lands on high charity, some platform on high charity, and he sees Mercy, the prophet of mercy, um, being uh, uh, attacked by this flood parasitic form. And Chief walks up to him. He says, your pal, where is he going? So right right there, you got this dry wit that's kind of acknowledging the stakes of everything that's happening, but he's just kind of uh, callous and humorous in the face of it. And it's just so, the delivery is so dry. Like yeah. Steve Downs, man. He's so, he's so fucking... He has no love for this so character. Yeah, this, this right. character that he's talking to, he's like, fuck this guy. I... I I'm, you know, I, I have no sympathy for him whatsoever. I'm not here to, you know, sympathize with him. I got shit yeah. to do. It's like appropriately callous. Unlike, you know, when he stomps that fucking elite's head flat in the show, where I'm just kind of dismayed. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I like this. Um, but in the case of that cutscene, it's like, yeah, I get that he doesn't have any sympathy for this dude. Like, he brought this on himself, these prophets. And they don't have any honor amongst themselves. Like, they'll all fucking sell each other out or kill each other to save their own skin. Like, they, they, the, these elites, the prof, or the, the covenant prophets, they talk of all this, like, camaraderie in, in the pursuit of the great journey or whatever, but they don't care about each other. They just want that ascendance for themselves, I guess, because they see that utopian world in af following the ascendance when it's really just everyone getting consumed by this terrible parasite and that's exactly what's happening to him in that cutscene he's literally getting strangled by this flood form the tentacles are wrapped around his neck and he's looking at chief and he's still convinced wholeheartedly by his ideology like he's willing to give himself to the great journey and he's unwilling to look the horror of his ideology in the face which is this flood form that has his tentacles around his neck, is choking the life out of him actively, and he's like still willfully ignorant. And that kind of in itself, that little beat is like poetic because it embodies this whole idea of the dangers of giving yourself wholeheartedly to an ideology, right? Where you, you make no room for new information or the truth in your closed system of thought. And then so that beat is followed by Chief showing the prophet of mercy mercy by pulling off the the flood form off of him and saving his life i think i think it's ambiguous maybe whether he's he's dead or not i'm oh. not quite sure but he pulls it off of him in an attempt presumably to save him and then he goes to cortana and he has this 
the scene moves along quite unnaturally quickly, but it's a video game, so I, ex- I accept yeah. that to happen. But he has this emotional exchange with Cortana where Cortana reveals her plan to detonate the engine of a ship that's there in the event that the Prophet of Truth decides to activate the Halo array from the Ark, which is where he's going. And the requirement of that is that she, or Cortana needs to leave herself behind on high charity. And, and Chief is now faced for the first time with the possibility of leaving her behind and he might not ever see her again. And it cuts to a close shot of him and Cortana's reflection is filling his visor completely. And there's a, there's a UNSC ship with flood forms on it that crashes behind him. Or he can hear it coming. And yeah, you it's see a pelican his... right behind him. Yeah, it lands on the platform. Right. But if you pay close attention to Chief's body language there, he turns his body to like see... like Because oh, he knows the ship is like hurtling towards high charity behind him but his gaze is dead fixed on cortana because you know that's what he cares about in this instance he doesn't want to let her go he doesn't want to leave her behind and there's there's so much emotion in that scene and it's you don't even need to see his face it's all just in the shot composition and the the order of shots and the the length of shots right because if you hang on a certain shot for an a normally long length of time it's kind of telling the audience something like oh i there's like an extra little thing here i should be paying attention to right in this case it's chief's affection for cortana which he would never express through words but there's he says like when he gets in the arc is like i'm i'm when you know when i'm done with all this i'm you right know, implying that i'm going to come back and get you but he never gets to say it because cortana says you know don't make a girl a promise you can't keep Right, exactly. The, and th- lines like that, don't make a promise you can't keep. I mean, there's all these, like, just these epic kind of, I don't want to say one-liners, because that makes it sound like bad, like, cheap writing or something. But, like, it just, the, all the dialogue works so well. And then the, the, the UNSC ship crashes, and the flood comes out, and then it th- throws you right into gameplay where you're shooting the flood. And it's all charged by this emotional idea of, like, Chief leaving behind the one grounding element that he's always had up until this point. And it feels so epic, right? And that's... I just wanted to be compelled... As compelled by the narrative of the, sh- of the show as I was by the games. And that's a shining example of how the games really got me gripped narratively. If I had gotten that feeling from the show, even just once... <laughs> I would have a, a much better opinion of it, you know, but it's just so obviously inferior and the games did a much better job telling a story and it's like, you know, you have the, all these like uh, apologists for the show who are just like, oh, shut up. It's good. Okay. It's good. Like, it doesn't have to be exactly like the games and I'm just, I don't expect it to be exactly like the games. I'm just saying it should be equally, just at least equally, if not more compelling like if you're gonna make a yeah we don't expect a tv we don't adaptation expect games in tv form that's just i don't know if there's anyone who was out there really saying it needs to be the games i just don't think there's that like it's not something that i feel is expected like people know that there will be changes that there it's a new medium so it's going to be something different there's just nothing could be more or less than what the halo you know original stuff was i don't think people kind of get that particularly at this point now that it's had time to simmer what we've been describing uh, is techniques not even that like, it has to be one to one just just talented ways we of expected some level of artistry yeah. yeah some storytelling and the more you think about halo and a lot of the cut scenes and a lot of character interactions and lines the just the better it gets um, but the more you think about this series, the worse and worse it's going to get. You'll notice more and more problems. You'll notice more and more issues. You'll notice that you'll notice more and more that there's less to notice. Right. So I, yeah. I cannot stand that the TV showrunners have neglected this cinematic content from the likes of like the Halo 2 cutscenes. It's just like I, I would gladly watch these cutscenes back to back in a theater and enjoy that much more than the show that you have produced you know and it pisses me off
Hello, you just listened to a segment of the podcast Every Frame of Pause, or EFAP, hosted by YouTubers Mauler, Rags, and Fringy, and joined by a cycling variety of guests across the internet. They critically analyze media with exhaustive detail while pausing at every single frame. Subscribe to the EFAP channel and catch new episodes on Saturdays, as well as catch their smaller videos reacting to the latest and not-so-greatest movies and TV shows throughout the week. You can also subscribe here to EFAP highlights for the latest shorts, clips, and supercuts also up uploaded throughout the week. Links to all the relevant channels can be found in the description section below, as well as links to their communities on Reddit and Discord. Thanks for watching.